I've been thinking, and I think I can, or rather will, shall, uh, on a monthly basis, maybe make one video a month concerning language. What I want to talk about here is sociolinguistic transmission, as well as cultural transmission in the uh, broader context. There is some small subsector of my subscriber base that's interested in these topics, uh, in addition to my more conventional topics covering gender relations, humanity, and what have you. But what I want to talk about here is different mechanisms and modes um, by which sociolinguistic change, and not necessarily change per se, but sociolinguistic applications are uh, tra transmitted uh, within the modern context, and that there are actually two primary means, a trickle-down and a sort of ripple effect, though not neither has been exclusive to any uh, juncture in history, though there have been primary means of linguistic transmission and sociolinguistic transmission and, and lesser means. And I want to talk about how the modern world, specifically internet, has transformed the landscape uh, completely. But for some background, I'm going to talk about a few things. First, I'm going to talk about uh, New York City, a gentleman named William LeBob, a very famous sociolinguist uh, based in, I believe, University of Pennsylvania, who did some pretty pioneering work in the 1970s covering roticity in New York City English. He did a lot of other stuff too, but I'll be focusing on that. Uh, roticity is simply a description for how much Rness there is in, uh, in an English word. New York City traditionally, and this is, I'll be talking about this in a bit, has been eroded over time. But three, four decades ago, this was still very strong. In the 70s, that's when the Bob did his studies. It was very strong, very prominent. People of different uh, socioeconomic status displayed different levels of roticity. That is, more Rness. If you need a concrete example, take words such as father or mother. And someone of very low socioeconomic status would say something like father, mother. You see, it, it, it's a non-rhotic variety. Now, in the context of New York City, non-roticity, or turkey, burger, something like that, as opposed to turkey or burger. In the context of New York City, uh, non-roticity was, was viewed as non-prestigious. Uh, and not only that, it was, the, as I said, the, the lower you went down the rungs of the ladder of socioeconomic status and rank, the less roticity you had, the further up you went. Uh, the more rotis you had. So the, the upper echelons, the upper crust, if you will, the very wealthy New York City ites, dwellers of New York City, had almost exclusively rhotic uh, accents and rhotic pronunciation, the middle class being somewhere in between. Uh, a good example of this is actually my mother, who grew up in, in Brooklyn in the 1940s and 50s, and uh, she has a kind of a mixture. Uh, she grew up in a kind of lower middle class, somewhere between lower middle class, middle class, uh, family in Brooklyn. Uh, her parents were uh, immigrants from Eastern Europe. And yeah, the, she has some of that non-roticity even to this day in you know, certain words like mother, father, etc. Uh, you move on to someone like my, of my generation. I was born in the late 70s. And of course, you see a lot less of this. And then you move further along the temporal line and you see even less of it. Now, there, there's a reason for this, and I'll get into that in a bit, but you could track this to a T. What William LeBob demonstrated is that, one, it was very clear how the, the, what the modus operandi was, how this was working. I mean, basically, you know, if you had a lot of money, the chances that you had a very erotic form of English were very, very high, and if you didn't, well, pretty low. What was even more important was a sense of class consciousness with respect to language and what we call prestige accents in socio-linguistic uh, uh, jargon. And the fact that people of middle class and, and even lower socioeconomic class were very cognizant and very conscious of the differences in their speech patterns uh, compared to the upper class, the upper middle class, and the upper classes. That is to say, when people were surveyed from the lower socioeconomic state, uh, statuses and classes, and taken aside, say, in the form of an interview or a questionnaire, formally asked, uh, 
they were very conscious of their differences, and so they would actively strive in an artificial manner to implement rhoticity in their speech, even though the likelihood that their English was going to be rhotic in a daily conversation with their neighbors was, well, slim to none. So there was a very conscious awareness of the differences, and furthermore, people of the lower rungs, they knew that if they're going to be in a formal situation to make themselves appear... Uh, yeah, for lack of a better uh, descriptor, more civilized in air quotes, than, or, or at least ha give off airs of a, of a higher status, they would at least attempt to imitate uh, roticity. So they were, they were looking upwards uh, rather than amongst themselves, their peer group. They were looking outside of their peer group for purposes of putting on airs and showing off or rather presenting themselves to the world because people back in the day, in the context of New York City and elsewhere, I'll talk about the UK in a bit, looked upwards towards the, the higher socioeconomic status people uh, for a sense of, not necessarily inspiration, but a sense of, as an example, as an exemplar, you know, how, how are we to speak? These people on Madison Avenue, they all have very rhotic, uh, rhotic means of speaking. We should try to imitate that. That wasn't the norm, of course, in in normal in normal daily conversation. But when they were taken aside in an artificial environment, they consciously knew this, and of course, subconsciously, then correspondingly made an effort to make their English more rhotic. New York City, being a very old city in the United States, was a perfect example of this. And the, as I said, the two most important things to take away from this is, or rather, are the very conscious awareness uh, of people of the middle and lower socioeconomic brackets had of the differences between their speech patterns and the upper class speech patterns, as well as the fact that you could basically just tie it to a T as to who, who belonged to which uh, socioeconomic bracket based basic so almost solely on the degree of their roticity. There were other features as well, but the most important one that, that bears relevance and, and is worthy of mentioning is the roticity. Now you see similar things or have seen similar things in the UK. Uh, the UK has always had a much more robust uh, radio tra tradition vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the BBC. And the BBC for decades was sort of a gold standard. I mean, people looked up to that as a means of uh, how, how should I best speak in what situation. What's interesting about the UK is that it's much older than the United States is in terms of its socioeconomic, uh, rather sociolinguistic development, uh, for that matter, socioeconomic uh, development. And so it's had much more time to develop uh, regional varieties, very uh, disparate di forms of dialects, as well as a robust, ro very robust class system that exists uh, today, that exists to a much lesser extent in the United States. It exists, but not in the same sense that it exists in the UK. And once again, people look to the BBC and the people representing it, generally people of higher economic status, as a means of linguistic inspiration or as an example to follow. And of course, for centuries, over many centuries, London became the economic center of the world. And for that matter, Londonese English, at least the upper class varieties of it, uh, became a focal point and the, the way to go. Now, you might be asking, why am I mentioning all of that? Well, this is sociolinguistic transmission, and this is a form of transmission, sociolinguistic transmission. This is also a cultural transmission. And what we have here is effectively a trickle-down effect from top to bottom. The people of higher economic rank and status traditionally, uh, but not exclusively, but primarily and traditionally, would serve as a kind of inspiration, willingly, consciously, or not, for people are of lower economic status, and these people would then at least attempt to imitate them in various situations. Uh, it's still very common in the UK for people, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a bit hoarse, it's still very common in the UK these days for people with very strong accents that deviate from norms or particularly received pronunciation, uh, it's becoming less and less so the case, to try to receive training to get rid of their quote-unquote accent. 
And you find that to a much, much lesser degree in the United States because there's much less variety in the States. But traditionally, this had been the case, and this has just lessened and diminished over the years tremendously. As I said, as someone born in the late 1970s, uh, even my generation, we, I didn't grow up with any, I mean, I've heard, I heard it on the streets, but I never, my, I myself never spoke a form of non-rhotic English, even though I can imitate it quite well. Um, that's not true of my parents, and it's not true of uh, the generation before me. And things have been rapidly changing. And so the former model, which was a kind of trickle-down, socio-economically based uh, form of linguistic cultural change or transmission where you had the the higher classes by default uh, basically just serving as an example for other people to follow because people had this conscious awareness of their class or class system even if this class system an example in the United States is not as implicit or obvious as it is in the UK follow the upper classes example this has changed tremendously we really have I'd say in the last two decades experienced uh, just a, a earth-shakingly different uh, change in the way sociolinguistic and cultural transmission takes place. And if, in a way, it's a form of mimetics. Because you, know, really, you no longer really have a trickle-down effect so much as a ripple effect. Coolness, and to use the abstract uh, term that's so ill-defined, <clears throat> coolness is much is much, a much greater factor than socioeconomic status uh, these days. People who set trends to follow aren't necessarily people who are of greater socioeconomic status, specific, more, most specifically in the linguistic realm. We see this uh, very clearly, for example, in the use of quotative like and other uses of like in the United States. The use of like in virtually for a variety of reasons uh, to substitute for, you know, reporting that's quotative, and she was like, or to express doubt, uh, and he was like uh, at home at 7 o'clock and things of that nature. Uh, this is not a, a linguistic phenomenon that was transmitted uh, by some people of, of upper socioeconomic status. This was very organic. It came... Allegedly, it came from California. Nobody knows the true origins. It's everywhere, and in, in, it's not just, it's everywhere in English across the world now, but it's everywhere in the United States and in Canada and North America. And it, it really just spread organically in a ripple effect. You can just imagine you know, throwing a stone or a pebble into a pond, and you can just imagine the ripples spreading uh, outwards. That wasn't, I mean, that traditionally didn't, tended not to be the case. Yes, you had those cases, but it, it, they, they remain largely confined to small communities. Within, specifically, they remain largely confined to communities within a smaller socioeconomic state, or of a particular socioeconomic, socioeconomic status, rather than everywhere. I mean, every Tom, Dick, and Harry in the United States, Canada, and, and most places in the English-speaking world these days uses some form of the word like for the various functions I've already cited in the past, quotative, doubt, etc., uh, hedging your bets like, that's another one, which is pretty much the same thing as doubting like. This was not what we could have traditionally observed, say, in the 1970s and, and further back, because there's no sense of class awareness associated with the use of like as a sociolinguistic phenomenon. And, of course, you know now it's, it's actually a synty syntactic ph phenomenon. It's part of the rules of modern English. It's a rule that doesn't apply to my English because I haven't, I wasn't exposed to it, and so I've lived outside of that environment. But for most English speakers these days, it's part of their syntax. And what do I mean by that? It's part of the core, core rules of grammar that apply um, to their language. But notice there's no sense of class awareness there whatsoever. Yes, it's still frowned upon in an official context, but uh, most people who are 45 or younger employ it routinely in, in, in almost every colloquial situation and perhaps in you know, semi-formal situations as well. Notice the difference. No class awareness in this transmission of this particular uh, phenomenon. Uh, and, th and this is, of course, a syntactic phenomenon, more, much more than, well, 
almost entirely a syntactic phenomenon, semantic phenomenon as opposed to a uh, phonological or phonetic phenomenon, but still, no class awareness. The interesting thing when it comes to British English, though, where, it, where I would re refer to something that is a phonological phenomenon called TH fronting, uh, you might have heard of Cockney, which is you know, so endemic to London. Cockney has several uh, features. One is a, ten a, tending, uh, a tendency to drop H's, that is, you know, from words. So instead of saying height, you would say it and things like that. Man, Woman, Myth has a slight london -y. It's not very strong. He has that a bit. Uh, but the most important feature is TH fronting where you would have uh, certain what we call fricative sounds that have basically bare friction, dental fricatives in this case, like th and, and the, dropped and, tr and basically transformed, if you will, into a different kind of fricative we call an alveolar fricative, like a f or a f. So words like through or three become free or fru, a word such as thumb becomes thumb, a word such as with would become with, and so on and so forth. It's, this is not limited to the UK. You'll find it in some varieties of the United States as well. Now, what's interesting about this is that Cockney English, uh, that is Londonese, if you will, was always uh, regarded as belonging to a, a rather low socioeconomic ranking status. N nobody ever sought to imitate that uh, before. In fact, back in the day, people would actively strive to get rid of their Londonese Cockney accents in an effort to acquire something that was much more similar to what we call received pronunciation, uh, something that most Americans would imagine as being Queen's English, maybe, although it's not really quite that, but basically a standard non-rhotic uh, British English that people can imagine. Um, Catherine Zeta-Jones, for example, would be exa a good example of having a, a very standard RP accent if you can remember the way she speaks. But yeah, no one was trying to imitate Cockney. And this is because there was always, there's always been a very robust class system in the UK as opposed to the United States. And what's been fascinating in the UK in the last two decades has been basically, uh, on a phonological level, akin to the like phenomenon, the syntactic like phenomenon in the United States, where <clears throat> rather than a a tri trickle-down effect from the upper classes, you're having sort of a ripple effect from essentially a, a lower socioeconomic status based solely on a quote-unquote coolness factor. So this, the, the, the TH fronting uh, phenomenon, which was traditionally confined to London and areas near London, southeastern uh, uh, England, has spread northwards as far as places in Manchester sometimes. That's, I mean, it's not extreme there, but you'll find it and spreading throughout the country. And this is an amazing thing because it has nothing to do with class awareness so much as it has to do with trending and, and coolness awareness. So what I've been, so you'll find people, as I said, in the Midlands and the more northerly parts of the UK engaging in what we call TH fronting, things like whiff or fum, fru instead of through and so on and so forth because it's regarded as cool. Uh, the epicenter, of course, ha has been London, but it's kind of the cool way to go. Notice how these people that are uh, engaging in this uh, sociolinguistic or sociophonological transmission are not doing this uh, on the basis of conscious uh, class uh, class distinction. Or they're not consciously aware of class distinctions, and the difference in class isn't the primary motivator. It's much more of a coolness factor. It's, it's, it's the trend. And I think, <clears throat> and once again, apologies for being hoarse, I think you'll see this more and more in the coming years and decades, that traditional sociolinguistic change, which was based very much on socioeconomic status, class distinction, awareness, and so on and so forth, has been eroded, if not completely deleted, in favor of a kind of coolness factor where, and once again, if you can imagine the ripple effect of, of spreading across evenly rather than sort of dripping downwards, which would be a trickle-down effect. <clears throat>
And this is, of course, in very large measure, thanks to the Internet, uh, there are no longer what we would call, quote-unquote, standards of language, uh, such as the BBC, something to strive for. And anything goes, everything goes. Read the comment section of any YouTube video. It'll be littered with grammatical and, and, spe and spelling errors. And uh, there's all kinds, there's internet speak, there are abbreviations, you know, AFK, T THB to be honest, uh, and so on and so forth. And this is all part of a, a new lingo that has evolved over the past two decades. And this essentially has replaced and supplanted the, old, the older model. And once again, it's not to say that this kind of thing didn't exist prior, it did. You had the ripple effect, sociolinguistic, cultural transmission as well, but it was much, as I said, much more confined to smaller circles and circles of certain socioeconomic uh, distinction and class rather than a, a sort of pan-global phenomenon that we're seeing here. I mean, with the regards to like, you'll see it in, in basically every form of English across the globe and so on and so forth. And I mean, this is not to say that distinctions still, still don't exist. One thing you'll notice very, very common in Australian English, particularly people who are of middle class or lower middle class in Australian English is what you call palatal assimilation. You'll hear very often, uh, Spetsnaz does it, lots of other people do it, instead of saying assuming, they'll say assuming, and so on and so forth. That's very, very common. Uh, it can even occur in people who are well-educated. Uh, but th there's still, a, so every country has its own distinctions that are still in place. But by and large, and I'm, I haven't been keeping tabs too much on the Australian variants, but I, one could imagine that at some point in time, what we call parallel assimilation becomes the norm. And so everyone in Australia will, instead of saying assuming, will be saying assuming and, and, uh, and, uh, and so on and so forth. I mean, there's a lot of analogical stuff there, such as assure versus assume. You know, it seems similar. I don't want to get into that too much. But the overall trend, thanks to the Internet, is that everything goes, and coolness, popularity, independent of some specific socioeconomic bracket, has become the, the measure of things, the, the means by which we measure things in terms of our... Uh, acclimation and sociolinguistic adaptation to to trends, conscious and unconscious. I mean, I myself am a bit of a relic. I, I don't I don't live in a country of my native language, and I'm, my speech in many ways is a bit fossilized. Part of that's intentional because of my classical background. I tend to use archaic forms because I think it's good to maintain them, but it does help to observe trends of which I am not part, because I can see what's happening. And as a former linguist, it's quite interesting. So to summarize the contents of the video, we have two forms of sociolinguistic transmission, the trickle-down, which was sort of the older model, and now the, what I would call the ripple effect, where it's just a sort of a coolness factor, a popularity factor. And you see this because, as I said, nobody back in the day was looking to engage in TH fronting in places like Manchester or Birmingham. Uh, or, or and elsewhere, but it's just it's because it's regarded as cool, and London is still an, is not so much well. London is still an, an epicenter of economic activity, but it's uh, certainly an epicenter of cultural activity, the music scene, and so on and so forth. A lot of stuff goes out from there, and then influences other people, and it is quite interesting the way that operates these days. So, having said that, I will end the video there. There, of course, could be a lot more to talk about on the subject. But I know not everyone's interested, one, and two, uh, to go more into it require a lot of details that people don't necessarily, without a background, and would, uh, would get. So I'll end it here. I hope that was interesting. And yeah, if you're interested, leave comments. I'll try to respond to that. And of course, I'm still working on a scripted video on a much more conventional topic. So, you know, stay in your seats, stay uh, buckled, and uh, I will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.